What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kafinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guest in today's episode is Jacob Siegel, a senior editor at Tablet Magazine and the author of a widely shared article about the subject of disinformation titled, A Guide to Understanding the Hoax of the Century. That hoax, according to Jacob, is the information war itself, which he believes conflates the anti-establishment politics of domestic populists with acts of war by foreign enemies, turning the American people into targets for mass psychological operations and into instruments of control. Jacob and I spend the first hour of our conversation trying to wrap our arms around this sprawling leviathan of public and private surveillance in order to both understand it and reassert our power over it and over an information environment that has left us feeling increasingly disoriented and vulnerable to both foreign interference and the disinformation efforts of our own government and intelligence agencies. The second hour of our conversation is devoted to thinking through, and in some cases, arguing about what can be done to begin to solve the problem. As you will hear, and as regular listeners know, I am of the view that we can and should regulate these platforms by introducing governing incentives, epistemic objectives, and transparency that is nonpartisan, and which can produce an information environment that is in everyone's best interests. If you want access to that part of the conversation, and you're not already subscribed to Hidden Forces, you can join our premium feed and listen to the second hour of today's episode by going to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe. All of our content tiers give you access to our premium feed, which you can listen to on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. If you wanna join in on the conversation and become a member of the Hidden Forces Genius Community, which includes Q&A calls with guests, access to special research and analysis, in-person events, and dinners. You can also do that on our subscriber page. And if you still have questions, feel free to send an email to info at hiddenforces.io. And I, or someone from our team, will get right back to you. And with that, please enjoy this incredibly important conversation with my guest, Jacob Siegel. Jacob Siegel, welcome to Hidden Forces. Thank you for having me. I've been enjoying reading your stuff, Jacob. You're a great writer. For people that aren't familiar with you, before we start, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got into writing publicly, you know, on various magazines. You write for Unheard, you write for Tablet. How did you get to where you are today? I mean, the short answer is that it started in Brooklyn, New York, with my father, Fred Siegel, who's an historian and a writer. And my brother, my older brother, Harry Siegel, was in journalism. And when I got back from Afghanistan, I left Brooklyn, took some travels uh, to various places. And in 2012, I deployed to Afghanistan with the army. When I got back, I took my first real job in journalism. Prior to that, actually, I had been writing prior to that, but I had been writing fiction. So when I got back from Iraq, actually, to rewind for a second, I met a number of other veteran writers in a free writing workshop run by NYU, which was just a, an incredible, really fortuitous opportunity. We all just randomly sort of wandered into this free writing workshop. And through that, I met people like Phil Cly, Royce Granton, Matt Gallagher, with whom I would go on to edit an anthology of literary fiction called Fire and Forget which was the first and the preeminent collection of short stories, really the preeminent work of fiction by Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. So Mm -hmm. that came out, I believe it came out in 2012, which was the same time I was in Afghanistan. And then I got back from Afghanistan with plans to continue writing fiction, which was my first love in terms of writing and still the thing I care most about. But, you know, it's no way to earn a living, despite some exceptions, like my friend Phil Cly. And so I took a job. My brother was at the Daily Beast at the time. I took a job at the Daily Beast as the more or less the veterans affairs reporter and editor. 
and parlayed that into a job doing national security, reporting, writing about various issues related to veterans, including corruption and the VA system. And so it, it all just sort of worked outward from there. So that was my first real job in journalism. I took the leap from fiction to journalism, but I had a family background in writing. And so it wasn't a great stretch. And uh, now I'm at Tablet Magazine, where I'm, uh, you know, I think on any given day, the best magazine in America. And I'm um, the senior news editor there. I do a daily newsletter called The Scroll comes out every afternoon. I, I write frequently for them. And as you mentioned, for other places. So a bit of this, a bit of that is how I got to where I am now. Yeah. Tablet is a, a great magazine and it's one of a number of new journalistic outfits, outfits that's come out over the years that is just doing exceptional work and speaking to a lot of deeper cultural, spiritual philosophical issues that people are concerned about that aren't really represented somehow in the mainstream press. I'm curious, before we get into your big piece on disinformation, which is why I should have come here, I'm curious, well, one, do you agree with that? And what do you think that's about? Why now? And what are organizations like Tablet speaking to that people are looking for? Yeah, I definitely agree with it. It's harder for me to talk about the other places that maybe we share some affinities with, but I can tell you what I know about why Tablet is doing the kind of extraordinary work that Tablet has been doing and that would once have been, you know, something you might have expected at the the really big glossy places with much bigger budgets and the ability to attract more prestigious writers. But those places have sort of They've collapsed in the same way that other elite institutions in the United States have collapsed. And largely for the same reasons, they got invested in self-serving delusional narratives. They chased after Trump-Russia collusion stuff. They started to see their fellow Americans as um, broken and uh, degenerate in some way and themselves as sort of... um, shepherds and members of an elect whose job was not to report on the country or be curious and inquisitive, but rather to push through moral mandates. So that's a the sort of larger story of corruption and collapse. And Tablet has been an exception for a number of reasons, most notably because on the people who run it, Alana Newhouse, the editor, has guts and isn't easily cowed and is not looking for the kind of adoration and uh, you know career approval that I think some other people in her position are looking for. Maybe because certainly it hasn't always been easy for Tablet. You know, when we were publishing, one of the first places publishing pieces skeptical of lockdown, skeptical of the vaccine approval process in the United States, and doing so in a way that was not sort of red meat for the right wing. So it wasn't like we were challenging liberals, but at the same time picking up a vast new right wing audience because it was done in a sort of dispassionate, skeptical way. The sort of thing you might have found in these other prestigious magazines a few decades ago. But that that certainly was not always a popular thing to do. And Tablet has just cultivated its position as a Jewish magazine as the most is really the key to it. It's that in being deeply invested in the idea of being a Jewish magazine and what that entails, accepting one's position as an outsider to some extent, Mm. and also not viewing political fashions as the highest authority, not viewing ideology as uh, not being sort of idolatrous in our relationship to cultural or ideological trends has freed up a space, a sort of skeptical, interested space. You know, you took the words out of my mouth because that was going to be my next question, which is, I wonder if part of what explains Tablet's success is its grounding in tradition and in an identity that is less swayable or less swayed by the ebbs and flows of modernity and a lot of the reactionary culture of today. I think that's exactly right. But at the same time, you know, in terms of what we cover, 
tablet is now more cosmopolitan than it's ever mm. been. So a decade ago, the kinds of stories you would find on tablet were, let's say, more straightforwardly, obviously Jewish in terms of their themes and subjects. Mm. You know, there was still political writing, there was still investigative reporting, all of that was still happening, but within a narrower and more explicitly Jewish focus. Now, as the U.S. news editor and the editor of this uh, daily newsletter, The Scroll, you know, 85, 90 percent of what I cover is not obviously Jewish. It's not Jewish in terms of uh, being of particular religious or communal interest to Jews. These are news stories about America and their Jewishness derives from the sort of sensibility and perspective with which we approach them which is you know with a, a particular understanding of the special relationship between Jews and America which has been a, you know an incredibly historically good relationship for Jews vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Jewish experience in Europe let's say mm. so it's partly through that it's partly through an understanding of what you said that there are traditions and texts and you know relationships that transcend the merely political the merely cultural and so we should view what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis through these deeper connections there's also a healthy skepticism around assimilation and a wariness of authoritarian power that i think makes the jewish community more Counterculturally relevant today than it was, say, in the early 2000s when Israeli politics and US policy around the war on terror had such a defining impact on Jewish politics in the US. And what's interesting about that is that it also speaks to another facet of identity, which is the military and the role of veterans in the counterculture today versus the early 2000s and the influence that they're having on public discourse and political analysis in a kind of communal way. Does that resonate with you? Is it something that you found to be true? You know, I'm, I'm not sure, frankly. I don't see what I'm doing necessarily as being reflective of a, a larger trend or a, a sort of larger community of veterans who are invested in the kind of political analysis or cultural analysis that I'm doing, but it doesn't mean it's not happening. You know, at the same time, I, I just said all of this about Tablet's Jewish identity. You know, I I don't feel especially close to American Jewish communal institutions. I feel like uh, basically an outsider. And I would say the same with my relationship to uh, American veterans organizations, with the exception of these small sort of close connections that I have, people like Phil Cly, who I co-host this podcast with, or Tablet. But mm. in general, you know, my relationship is sort of an outsider and an observer. And so if there is something to what you're describing, and there may very well be, I, I haven't been a part of it. And it hasn't been especially salient to me, honestly. Yeah. And I definitely don't want to put myself out as an expert on all these different cultural phenomena. What I guess I, I've picked up on is that there's a kind of independent center of gravity, both within the Jewish community and within the community of veterans. And maybe there's something about that that has created more interesting takes from people in those areas. But again, it's not something I've studied. It's just something that peripherally I've kind of noticed. And I, you're at the intersection of both of those with Tablet mm. and, and your experience as a veteran, which I didn't explicitly state. So that was a, a much longer background than I had uh, planned, Jacob, but I think it was actually interesting. So the reason that I asked you to come on the podcast today is the reason that a lot of people have been having you on recently. I've noticed that since I reached out to you, you've been kind of on a, on a bunch of different podcasts for good reason. And the reason is that you wrote recently, about uh, three weeks ago or so, I think it published an article in Tablet called A Guide to Understanding the Hoax of the Century. And it is an article about this phenomenon of disinformation it's not really about disinformation. I mean, it speaks to something larger, but through the vector of disinformation. So rather than have me explain it, I'd love for you to maybe talk about what you wrote in that article, and then we can sort of use that as a jumping off point to have a, a larger discussion about it and what you write about. Sure. So in around probably as early as late 2017, but certainly by mid-2018, 
I had begun to notice that this word disinformation, which I wasn't especially familiar with and wasn't something that one found commonly in public discourse, you know, during the Obama administration, for instance, was all of a sudden everywhere. And it was all of a sudden the sort of organizing principle of national security discourse, the organizing principle of high level political opposition to Donald Trump. It was all sort of revolving around this notion that there was this thing, disinformation, which had infiltrated the American political system, but not just the American political system, had infiltrated you know, the very ecosystem in which we all lived and in which the political system took place and was situated, and that having infiltrated it, it was now destroying liberal democracy from within. And what one could find these kinds of statements coming from NATO security officials, from US intelligence officials, one could find it in Congress, in the countering foreign disinformation and propaganda act that President Obama passed in December of 2016 and subsequent congressional committees and inquiries and bills. But also, you know, one could find it coming from the NGO sector, from progressive activists concerned about disinformation, radicalizing young people. And one could also find it coming from press outlets who seem to simply accept the premises of disinformation as if it was a sort of settled, objective, scientific phenomena. But having noticed that it was all of a sudden everywhere and that it was also its ubiquitousness was accompanied by a what was presented as an imminent existential threat to America that demanded immediate action be taken to fundamentally change the American political system, to fundamentally rewrite the rules of the internet, to restrict, if not outright eliminate free speech in a number of cases, to deem whole categories of information and inquiry so dangerous that they were off limits, lest one who was inquiring into those categories even accidentally spread Russian disinformation. So all of this seemed to happen very rapidly. It was obviously tied to this larger narrative about Donald Trump's, uh, what we now know to be a, a false narrative about Donald Trump's connections to the Kremlin. And it was being used to fundamentally alter not only the explicit rules of the American political system, but also the underlying political philosophy of American society with its emphasis on freedom of speech and freedom of association. So having noticed this, I started to look into it. And what I found was that it was a deliberate and coordinated strategy carried out by particular government agencies in concert with a particular set of government aligned NGOs that were then passed through essentially credulous and compliant press outfits. And I'm talking about, you know, not fringe press outfits, but the New York Times and the Washington Post. And uh, you know, at one point, the New York Times disinformation reporter, because every newspaper after a certain point had to have its own disinformation reporter, called for the appointment of a reality czar in the United States, something that would have seemed totally dystopian, ripped out of a, a Philip K. Dick novel. But, but now all of a sudden this was happening. So I started to look into this probably as early as 2018. Then two major events occurred, which put it into focus for me. One was the pandemic. And so what had begun as a, a framework that was nominally focused on Russian and foreign threats was seamlessly converted into an apparatus for controlling domestic political speech. And in fact, this had actually begun to occur prior to the COVID pandemic in 2020. But the COVID pandemic was what really put that into stark relief because all of the language and all of the sort of machinery of the 
censorship machinery that was supposed to combat Russian and foreign disinformation was transitioned without any open debate, without any democratic process or accountability, was simply transitioned over to enforcing not only issues like vaccine mandates, but to enforcing official narratives that we now know to have been untrue. So for instance, regarding the origins of COVID-19 and the lab leak theory, this machinery of disinformation and information regulation which was embedded into the social media platforms and which relied on this large and extended network of NGOs and academic research institutions who sort of credentialed and played the objective uh, experts when in fact they were you know, effectively working in tandem with intelligence agencies and political operatives began to now enforce COVID narratives. And Then the next thing that happened that was particularly significant for me was the Russian bounties story that your listeners may recall was the accusation that Russia was placing bounties on American soldiers in Afghanistan. And I immediately recognized this story as being sort of implausible and fantastical on its face as soon as I heard about it, having been a military intelligence officer in Afghanistan, it simply didn't pass the sniff test. And yet I saw the way that it was propagated through mainstream news outlets. Again, the New York Times and the Washington Post were the two papers that originally carried this story. So in other words, what you had was on the one hand, this large coordinated machinery of censorship that was simply purging from public discourse anything that dissented from the official narrative line on an issue like the origins of COVID, while at the same time, that same machinery could propagate false narratives, for instance, that explicitly political, I should say, false narratives, not merely erroneous narratives, let's say. This wasn't just a question of the official messaging of the White House getting something wrong. This was a brazenly false, brazenly partisan narrative leaked to the press at a moment where it was designed to have maximum political impact and just carried as and echoed endlessly by every high level democratic official, by all of the largest newspapers in the United States as if it was the truth. So mm. it was in the process of trying to absorb those things that I ended up thinking about this idea of disinformation as not simply a form of censorship, not simply a framework for regulating information to censor, but as its own form of government, as its own mandate, its own mandate to rule, that information regulation was replacing the official and explicit procedures of constitutional democracy as a new system of power inside the United States. And that's what I investigate in this piece. Fantastic summary, Jacob. So let's dig into this. I don't, I'm not entirely sure where and how I want to come at it, but it seems to me, maybe the best way to do it is to kind of put forward a a general kind of working hypothesis that I have, and we can kind of work our way around it. So like when I look back at the early 2000s, at that point in time, we still had this really powerful, largely centralized, hierarchical system of propaganda in the US. And that served very effectively to promote the Iraq war and the war on terror. And it's easy to forget now what an indomitable force that was. We had wall-to-wall coverage at all the major news networks, specialized shows on Fox, CNN, MSNBC, promoting the war with names like Countdown Iraq, an unbelievably calculated way of regimenting the minds of the citizenry and inculcating in people a sense of inevitability around the invasion, which many people were openly against. Now, fast forward to 2008, the financial crisis comes along, and that was the first time where, in my opinion at least, because of YouTube primarily, there were alternative sources of information that began to seep into the American mind. And at the time, when I was ingesting those sources, as someone who had already grown increasingly cynical about American power and the incentives of agents and government, I felt like I was 
coming into contact with the truth through what I was learning. And I became increasingly radicalized. I went down the whole Alex Jones rabbit hole. I ended up on David Icke and lizard people. And through those experiences and my time working at RT, which I didn't mention, I've come to the view that what's happened is that we've moved from this highly controlled information ecosystem where the US government didn't really have to worry about the quote Russians or any foreign actors meaningfully affecting public discourse to the point where we are now where the information environment in the United States is so chaotic that not only is the US government trying to regain control of it, but foreign actors are also trying to exploit it by spreading quote disinformation, which I don't know how tactical it is. I mean, it's, it seems to me that the real effort is to undermine our sense of reality, to demoralize us and to seed and amplify cynicism in a way that further cripples our capacity to come together as a society. Stuff that Peter Pomerantsev, who's been on the show before, writes about so persuasively. I'm curious, do you agree with that framing? Do you disagree with it? Where do you come down on this? I largely agree with that framing. You you lost me at the end, and I'll get to that in a second, but I, I agreed with the first 85% of it. And the reason why it's so difficult to describe is because it's a new cosmos. It's This is the Gutenberg revolution. We're at the dawn of digital political age that we can scarcely understand at this point, but which is already destabilizing and reformatting, you know, institution after institution. So it's not as if the American political class simply hallucinated that there was a destabilizing effect, that the internet was, you know, creating this sort of chaotic effect, but they falsely attributed that to Russian disinformation tactics. So in other words, they took what is a broad socio-technological revolution on the order of the printing press and one which has undermined the kind of centralized narrative authority that you were describing was still in place in 2003, one that has had that effect in many places, not only in the United States, and one that has had that effect on many institutions within the United States, not simply on the, the government or the sort of neoliberal establishment. They took that and they insisted that it was all Russian disinformation all along. And I find that to be implausible on its face. It's clear that Russia has attempted to have a destabilizing effect. It's clear that Russia spreads propaganda in much the same way that other countries, including the United States, attempt to seed propaganda into you know foreign information ecosystems. But it's not by any means clear that this has had a profound effect in terms of changing political attitudes in the United States. And, and when you look more closely at the evidence, the largest claims for Russia's hacking of the United States political system break down under scrutiny. So the Facebook ad buys are one example. We heard all of these reports about Russia infiltrating Facebook. But when you looked at the ad buys, it was something like $100,000. They didn't all go to Donald Trump. When you looked at the activity of the infamous Russian trolls, you found that, okay, you could say they got X number of impressions, but an impression just means somebody looked at something. It doesn't mean it had any pointed or determinative effect on their thinking. And many of these trolling efforts were they were laughable. Now, mm -hmm. might they have had some sort of effect in the aggregate? Yeah, they could have had an effect in the aggregate, but the effect would have been merely to exacerbate a kind of informational confusion that already existed. You mm -hmm. know, there's a, a the great French philosopher of propaganda, Jacques Ellul, in his book, Propaganda, the Formation of Men's Attitudes, for one thing, he makes a distinction between foreign propaganda and domestic propaganda. So domestic propaganda, in other words, propaganda used by a government and directed at its own population is almost always more powerful than foreign propaganda simply because 
it understands the premises and priors of the target population. And good propaganda is not implanting some wholly new and foreign idea in somebody's head. It's working off of the assumptions that they already have. So the sort of standard operating procedures of propaganda would limit the effectiveness of some of these Russian campaigns. So it's clear that some of the things Pomerantsev describes, I think, are are real, and they certainly match some of the ambitions of the Russian government, but they are both implausible in, as explanations for what has taken place in the United States, and they are also cynically and opportunistically exaggerated by political actors in the United States. So, you know, the Steele dossier, whatever Russia was doing in 2016, the Steele dossier was a piece of political opposition research paid for by the Hillary Clinton campaign, originally paid for actually by a conservative institution when Trump was still one among many candidates in the Republican field, was originally funded by Republicans to knock Trump out of the Republican field. That didn't work. The Clinton campaign picked it up. They were working with this outfit called Fusion GPS, essentially a private intelligence firm run by these former Wall Street Journal reporters. And it was a political document. It was a nakedly, overtly partisan political document with ludicrously thin sourcing. You know, much of it we've since learned was actually coming from not from these deep Kremlin sources that Christopher Steele had, but from Russian think tank employees working in Washington, D.C. I mean, that's the extraordinary thing about it. To come back for a moment to this sort of idea that I was laying out a minute ago, that these things that are presented as foreign threats are are really a way of sort of obscuring domestic threats and turning them into sort of opening up the possibility of using the tools of warfare against what are in fact domestic elements. The Steele dossier itself was a sort of fantasy of Russia, which came from people inside DC. So Yes, there is a destabilizing and chaotic effect that chaos promoting effect that the internet is having, but that doesn't explain how we got this essentially attempted coup on a a sitting president. So again, a lot of things to discuss here. It was rather amazing after the election of Donald Trump, just how many outlets and how many political hacks in the mainstream media amplified and facilitated so many contrived narratives promoting ridiculous conspiracies like the PP tape and head on criminals like Michael Avenatti and porn star Stormy Daniels as though they were paragons of virtue and credibility, which is also a great lesson for people who are trying to discern the credibility of any particular narrative should always be very wary when a small number of sources keep getting brought up over and over again as being central to the story. We had the same thing in the lead up to the Iraq war. So I want to draw a distinction here between, because I use the word disinformation and I use the word misinformation. And one of the things that I've sort of come to realize over time as I read other people whose work I agree with like yours or others, is that I can easily see how someone hearing me use the word disinformation could misinterpret that as being a signal for something else. So when I talk about Russian disinformation, I don't actually mean tactically that there was this you know effort to undermine the US elections. Actually, the analysis of someone like Yokai Benkler is something much more on point with what sort of how I see this, which is I think there is an effort to undermine our sense of trust in our institutions, which we already distrust for good reasons. And that if anything, our reaction, the mainstream press's reaction to the 2016 election actually played right into that strategy. But that ultimately all of that exploits our internal weakness, which stems from the lack of accountability, the understandable loss of trust in institutions, and the larger technological problem that we have, which is that this marketplace of ideas, so to speak, which was enhanced by the promise of a free and open internet, has been captured by these platforms that increasingly 
define people's sense of reality and moderate conversations such that even the word censorship doesn't really make sense anymore because every manifestation of speech on these networks is a discretionary choice of the platform that happens almost entirely at the level of algorithms in an automated fashion, amplifying or suppressing one thing or another because it's basically impossible to run these platforms in any other way and make them actually usable and useful for people. So I'm curious, like, how do you view that, that framing and how similar or different is it to how you view the problem? I appreciate hearing hearing you lay this out. It's interesting for me to hear. And, and I think what you just said, particularly at the end there, is very sharp. And that's exactly right, that the power of these platforms is so vast and so determinative of underlying social realities and the, the way in which they sort of control not only the pillars of the political economy at this point, but also they control the arena in which social life occurs, mm. not just politics, dating, routine interaction. And I avoid the terms disinformation and misinformation. There's a reason why in this very long essay I just wrote, I never do what is sort of the standard pro forma move in all of these pieces and define disinformation versus misinformation. The reason why I don't do that is that I think that they are Aristotle's technical signifiers. They have no real meaning beyond the ways in which they serve the interests of the party in power. So the idea that there is some category of information, some category of objective statements or facts that could be labeled misinformation in a, a kind of, is a, a regulatory function. It's not an epistemological function. It doesn't serve the interests of conversation or of debate. It's only a tool for regulators. And I'm not interested in playing this game and reifying this false scientific air, and nor am I interested in helping out the, the regulators in this way. So I avoid it. But I will grant that there is a effort to seed false narratives. Let's just isolate Russia for a moment. Russia is not the only country that does this. But Russia clearly made efforts, and I'm sure continues to make efforts, though I haven't studied some of the more recent campaigns, to seed false and divisive efforts, not only in the United States, but certainly in Eastern Europe as well, and probably actually much more so in Eastern Europe than in the United States. However, the question is, first of all, we could simply call that propaganda. I'm sorry, I just want to say, I think the reason why the word propaganda doesn't fit well is that there's not necessarily an underlying ideology or message that's being propagated. I think that was true during the Cold War, but I, don't, I think that's where I go back to Peter Pomerantsev, and I think what he does so well is convey that. there's there, What there seems to be is there seems to be a systematic effort to undermine some of the central pillars of what we do believe without necessarily replacing it with a larger narrative. Yeah, but it's the effort is to replace it with Russian power and with a an expanding Russian state. So I, I do think there is a core to it. Look, it's not nihilistic, right? Putin is not a chaos agent. He's not a nihilistic chaos agent. He has a particular set of interests. But I, I do think actually it's interesting you say that. I do think that not not in Russia. Forget, let's say, Peter's depiction of Russia when he lived there, when he's a producer, because I didn't live there and I'm in no position to, to discuss that. But it does feel that there is an effort to inspire a sense of nihilism around our own uh, sort of identities as Americans and our reverence for our institutions and to sort of inculcate a sense of cynicism. That does seem to be part of it. And I mentioned, you know, my part, my time working at RT, you know, when I look back now at that time, at the time, this the... And by the way, I also should mention this, Jacob, you and I have never spoken, like in the years leading up to the Ukraine war on this show, I was very critical of this narrative against Russia. And I had on guests who I've talked about before, people like Stephen Cohen, who was my professor of Soviet studies in college. So I'm definitely not coming at this from the perspective of being an apologist for American power and, and institutions. But I look back at my time there and, it, and I realize now that a lot of what 
a lot of the pushback that I got in editorial meetings was around wanting the content ultimately to be more cynical, to make people question not necessarily any particular narrative or to implant new narratives, but to just undermine their overall sense of confidence in everything and even in their ability to understand anything and to become cynical. And it feels like right. that is what I try to speak to when I use the word disinformation. But the reason why that narrative that you've just laid out is powerful among people in the West and in the United States is because we're cynical about our own government. Yes. And in its own strange way, it's actually a very optimistic view, right? Because it suggests that if we can merely eliminate this outside Russian in interference, perhaps we can recapture the legitimacy of those institutions and recapture something like the broad social consensus under which we once lived and which promoted you know, a, a prosperous and fairly stable society. I don't think that's the case. And I say this as somebody who, you know, you said you're, you're no apologist for uh, American power. I'm no apologist for Russian power. I have no particular affection for Russia. And, you know, insofar as I have a dog in this fight, I'm an American uh, and I'm an American writer and that's where my loyalties and my interests lie. But I think that the excessive focus on Russia has been a very destructive distraction that has actually precluded our ability to address the fundamental sources of instability, cynicism, and distrust in American society. Let me give you a, another way to think totally about this. Totally agree with this. that, by the way. Let me give you another way to think about this that's a bit more concrete, because these conversations about sort of narrative propagation, part of what makes them so powerful in exactly the way you just described and the way you know Russia might use them, the conversation itself is sort of unmoored from concrete realities and therefore can never be fully resolved. The extent to which Russia is promoting nihilism, the extent to which that amorphous mm. nihilistic narrative affects what goes on in the United States. It's very difficult to measure and it's it's difficult to assess. It's a sort of subjective and affective domain in many ways. Think about this for a moment though. So disinformation, what we now refer to as disinformation and Russian disinformation tactics, in many ways conceptually grows out of a discourse around hybrid war and hybrid war theory, which was popularized in 2014 with the Russian invasion of Crimea, the Euromaidan protests in Ukraine, which the US backed, sponsored and backed and Russia opposed. And at the same time, the Islamic State's campaign in Syria and Iraq and its capture of Mosul in 2014. These three events, which I talk about in my tablet essay, all three sort of elevated the stature of hybrid war as the dominant new theory among NATO and American security specialists. And what hybrid war referred to was this mixture of conventional overt military tactics and covert military tactics that especially drew on information operations and attempt to message the public, particularly through social media. So you'll recall some of the ISIS social media campaigns, these really like barbaric memes that they were propagating in 2014. Mm -hmm. And Russia spreading these stories about whichever, you know, one of the Baltic countries, they, they did it in a number of places in Ukraine or in the Baltic countries, spreading stories that were intended to cause the local populations there to lose faith in their own governments, to overestimate the strength of the Russian military forces, overestimate the strength of the Russian government, etc. So this is the hybrid war theory, and it it sort of is adjacent to what's called fourth generation war theory, and also what uh, is referred to as the Garamantsev doctrine inside of Russia, which is this new doctrine of informational warfare and, and in which influence operations are primary 
and you know the internet and winning the internet and winning narrative wars on the internet becomes as important if not more important than conventional military strength that at least is the way it's interpreted in the US and and among NATO defense officials so this is critically important because it lays the conceptual foundations for the contemporary disinformation discourse but what's interesting is that the earliest critics of this hybrid war theory many of the earliest critics were eastern european security officials who saw it as a way of distracting from the still vital measures of real military strength in beans and bullets in other words they were critical of this western and nato obsession with hybrid war because they thought that it was a kind of abstraction a, a sort of and not only an abstraction in the sense that it was a a mistake but also an evasion a means of avoiding the kinds of actual transfers of arms the actual reallocation of military mm. forces that would have been needed to contain the russian military and deter russian expansionism so that's one thing to keep in mind is that there is a kind of core material argument for the ways in which people simply get lost in these conversations it's not to say mm. that there's nothing to them it's not to say that there's there's no effort to sort of seed nihilism in the west from russia or china for that matter but it is a distraction from more vital matters and because it is by its nature so abstract and amorphous it lends itself this whole discourse lends itself to manipulation by the most powerful actors who get to determine what disinformation is you know disinformation is a word that only takes on meaning in the mouth of power it doesn't matter what somebody on the street calls disinformation it has no effect on anything the word itself only acquires meaning when it's used to censor in the american political context and so i think that's worth keeping in mind yeah so a lot of thoughts here one i encourage people to go back and listen to my conversation with david kilcullen a counterinsurgency expert with whom we talked about hybrid theories of war like liminal warfare and conceptual envelopment that incorporate elements of what we're talking about today, at least insofar as the national security state and the intelligence community see things. Look, there's nothing that I can point to in what you said, Jacob, that I would readily disagree with. This term disinformation has most certainly been used by the powerful to silence people. It's been used to discredit them and to deplatform them in many instances. And it's also been used, as we saw in the case of Donald Trump, to deflect attention away from the failures of institutional power structures and by elites who have governed these institutions. And I think, similarly, the lack of accountability among those in power has undermined our trust in government. And it's left us in a place that, to me at least, feels exceedingly vulnerable because of the unique dimensions of the international order today. And a lot of these conversations that we seem to have end up being about how to decide what is and is not true, how to sort out the, quote, disinformation, when in fact, what is needed, I think at least, and this is what I want to talk to you about in the second hour, Jacob, is a kind of very high level regulatory architecture that introduces transparency, that works at the level of incentives, so that there isn't any room for the CIA or the White House to sit in between you and me on Twitter, for example, deciding what is and is not appropriate speech. Instead, the platforms would have to adhere to certain best practices like, for example, I'm not saying this is the correct policy, but not selling people's attention to advertisers and not modeling their behavior as to make them maximally exploitable, which could have huge unforeseen benefits to public discourse. In other words, this idea that somehow the solution needs to be either unfiltered chaos, which wouldn't work for anyone, or a cartel of private companies with the government and the intelligence agencies exercising 
discretionary oversight, which is what we have now, this framing, this either or framing is false. There is another way, but it feels like we've lost the language to come up with solutions that are democratic. And that's where I felt frustrated with how this conversation continues to be framed. But that's something that we'll get into in the second hour, Jacob. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second hour of today's conversation with Jacob, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and sign up to one of our three content tiers. All subscribers gain access to our premium feed, which you can use to listen to the rest of today's conversation on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. Jacob, stick around, man. We're going to move the second half of our conversation onto the premium feed. If you want to listen in on the rest of today's conversation, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and join our premium feed. If you want to join in on the conversation and become a member of the Hidden Forces Genius Community, you can also do that through our subscriber page. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stilianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. You can follow me on Twitter at Kofinas, and you can email me at info at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. 